All right, so uh, I'm just going to be giving you, uh, people, uh, all of you, just a few basics about quantum networks. I mean, it's still very much a developing field. And um, if you come to the workshop next week, you'll really get a good idea as to the current status. I mean, one of the amazing things I found out very recently is that one of the companies that's going to be represented at the workshop, QNECT, is currently distributing entangled photons through uh, the fiber network under New York City. So I don't know how you plug into that network and, or what use you might have for entangled photons, but uh, they are there. So, uh, so um, is it, oops, this is going to be uh, kind of informal. I'm just going to give it via iPad. So quantum networks. So a network is you just have a bunch of nodes connected by some kind of communication uh, links, uh, something like that. And in a classical network, what you're sending are bits or strings of bits. So in a classical network, you would be sending zeros, uh, one, maybe another zero, another one, or something like that. And the um, the way classical networks work, say a fiber network, for example, you send your signals through the fiber. You can send it um, uh, uh, photons, uh, the usual thing. And what happens is there is attenuation. So you're sending a pulse uh, of photons through the uh, fiber. There is attenuation, so the size of the pulse shrinks. And there's also, uh, as a result, noise gets introduced. And the standard way of dealing with that in a classical network is to have amplifiers every so often that will uh, amplify the signal, it will make, boost it, and then it will go for another distance, it'll hit another amplifier, it will get boosted again. Now, that kind of system doesn't work in a quantum network, and so we will discuss why that's true. So first of all, what is a quantum network? So instead of sending zeros and ones, um, the way you do in a classical network, um, you send qubits. Okay, so what's a qubit? So a qubit uh, is an object in a two-dimensional space. Uh, so I have a basis states zero and one. And the general qubit would just be some linear combination of those things. Now, uh, in the case of a quantum network, uh, the zeros and ones would uh, uh, most likely be polarization states of photons. So in other words, the zero might correspond to a horizontally polarized photon, and the one might correspond to a vertically polarized photon. And so you would be sending a photon in some linear combination of horizontal and vertical photons through the network. Now, um, as I mentioned uh, in the classical case, the standard way of dealing with it is to amplify. That doesn't work in a quantum network. The reason being that if you amplify something, you can, you can show rather quickly if you have the mathematical formalism that even if you have gain, something that boosts the signal, you're also going to introduce noise. Uh, and you, can, you cannot have noiseless amplification. And in the case of qubits, that's fatal. The noise essentially wipes out the uh, quantum superposition and uh, you lose the quantum information if you try to amplify it. So we have to find some other way of uh, transmitting uh, uh, qubits through longer networks. Uh, and I will discuss uh, a few different ways of doing that. Uh, now, the other question is, uh, why would you want to send quantum information through a network in the first place? There are several possible uses. Um, uh, one is quantum cryptography. So quantum cryptography is a way of sending uh, encoded messages that are where the physics guarantees that there will be, uh, you can be sure that there's nobody listening in. So it, is, uh, it has been used on a small scale, uh, say within cities, 
Uh, it again runs into that problem that you can't send the signals over too long a distance, otherwise you run into this noise issue. Uh, so I think about, I don't know what the record is at this point. I think it's something on these, somewhere between maybe 50 and 100 kilometers, uh, if you're sending it through fibers, okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> another way of, of doing it, by the way, instead of fibers is to use a satellite. And there is in fact a satellite that uh, distributes entangled photons. We'll talk about entanglement in just a little bit. And uh, it was launched by China and it was used to uh, conduct quantum communication between, um, I forget exactly which city in China, but Vienna in Europe. And they were actually able to send uh, quantum uh, bits between uh, China and Vienna. And it's purely a demonstration system. It's not practical. The bit rates are just way too slow for anything reasonable. But the fact that they could do it at all is rather amazing. And the the reason that it works using a satellite is because the photons spend most of their trip going through not totally empty space, but pretty close to empty space, and they only hit the atmosphere toward the toward the very end, and it's not enough to introduce substantial noise. So satellites are a very real possibility for uh, quantum network and quantum communication. But at the moment, um, there's just the one, and it's really in a, a grand experiment is what it is. Another uh, possibility for a quantum network is um, uh, distributed quantum computing. So if you have several different quantum computers and they're in different places and you want to connect them to do a single problem, what you're going to have to do is send quantum information. You really can't send classical information uh, and expect, and you'll lose the quantum properties if you do. So that is um, that would be another use for uh, a quantum network. And, a, and a, a version of this is delegated. quantum computing. And uh, that's a situation where you have uh, a, a problem that you want to use a quantum computer for, but someone else has the quantum computer. Uh, and you don't really want them to know much about uh, what you're using their quantum computer for. So it's it's got kind of cryptographic elements to it. And one of the speakers at the, at the meeting, um, Ann Broadbent, is one of the two people who essentially invented delegated quantum computing. So you're going to be hearing from an absolute expert on that subject. Uh, I think, uh, okay, so I think that is most of the uses that I had. Uh, oh, I, I mean, and another use, let me just mention, is um, uh, detect, detector networks. So if I have a number of detectors that say are going to be, they're spread out, and they're going to be detecting some signal, a, typ a typical thing is say measuring uh, a magnetic field, uh, then uh, the question arises, suppose I entangle those detectors, say put them in some kind of an entangled quantum state, which would require a quantum network. Um, will that give us an advantage in, in say sensitivity of detection? So uh, we'll also have some talks on that subject, uh, both experimental and theoretical. Okay, so now let me talk about a few basic network protocols, all right? Uh, let me just go onto a new page for that. Um, The most important one is teleportation. Mm. 
And this is a, a way of possibly getting around this distance limitation that we have in, whereby we can't use amplifiers to boost the signal. And I'll, exp I'll explain how that it's teleportation plus another thing called entanglement swapping, uh, which are very closely related, uh, are a possible way of getting around the distance limitation if you're using fibers, okay? Again, if you do, the other way is just using satellites. So suppose we have our usual participants, Alice and Bob. And they share an entangled state. So what, what is an entangled state? So, so this, this is a, Q, a qubit for Alice, and this is a qubit for Bob. Now, a separable or non-entangled state of two qubits is just a qubit for Alice and a qubit for Bob. Okay, it's a product. And any state which is not a product, any two qubit state which is not a product is an entangled state. So not product is entangled. And we're going to assume that Alice and Bob use a very particular kind of entangled state. Um, uh, what's called a singlet state. And that looks like this, one over square root of two times, zero for Alice, one for Bob, minus one for Alice. Oops, Bob, and zero for Bob, all right? And they're able to use that state to send, uh, Alice can use that state to send a qubit to Bob. So let's see how that works. That is in fact the teleportation protocol. So we've got Alice and Bob sharing our, our <clears throat> singlet state, and Alice has another state, which I was gonna say is psi. And she wants to transmit psi to Bob. So the question is, how is she going to do that? Now, and it turns out that Alice doesn't even have to know what psi is with this procedure. So the way she does it is the following. So Alice wants to transmit. Okay, so what she does is she takes her two qubits. So Alice has the two qubits. She's got psi and she's got the one that's connected to Bob. Okay, so this is Alice here. So what she does is she measures her two qubits in the Bell basis. Okay, so the Bell basis looks like this. Okay, it consists of, well, we're in the two qubit space here. So it's gonna consist of four states and they look like this. And, uh, okay, zero, zero, plus minus one, one, and phi plus minus equals four over square root of two, zero, one plus minus one, zero. So she measures her two qubits, in other words, these two guys, in that basis. And she's gonna get some result. She will find that they are in one of the elements of, uh, of that basis as a result of her measurement. And then what she does is, I'll, I'll write this down in just a second. Then what she does is she then tells Bob what measurement result she got. So let's see what happens. So Alice measures.
All right. Uh, by the way, these, this, it's called bell basis because these states are very useful if you want to violate a bell inequality. But that's a it's, it's a related subject. And one of the talks, at least one of the talks at the meeting, will about be a relation be a generalization of bell inequalities to networks. <clears throat> So, uh, which is the subject I don't know much about. So I'm looking forward to that talk so I can learn about it. So anyway, so Alice measures in the bell basis and she tells Bob what she got. So let's see what Bob gets if she, for her different results. So Alice, this is what Alice gets. And then Bob has. So if Alice gets side plus, Bob gets, I will, I'll define the notation in a second, sigma x, sigma z, um, psi. And if she gets psi minus, uh, Bob gets sigma x, psi. If she gets phi plus, then Bob gets minus sigma z, psi. And if she gets phi minus, then Bob gets psi. Okay, so what are these sigma things? So sigma z does the following. Acting on zero, it gives zero. Acting on one, it gives minus one. Sigma x just flips. So sigma x acting on zero equals one. Sigma x acting on one gives zero. So you can see what happens is that Bob, uh, in general, gets a kind of distorted version of the state that Alice wants to transmit. In the case that Alice gets phi minus, he actually gets the state that uh, she that he, she wants him to get. But what about the other situations? Well, the thing is that these sigma operators have the really nice property that their square is equal to one. So sigma z squared equals one and sigma x squared equals one. So for example, suppose Bob got, suppose Alice got psi minus, all right? So that means that Bob has sigma x psi, all right? He can correct that. <clears throat> he can just, okay, he knows what he's got because Alice told him what the result of her measurement was. So he knows that he's got sigma x psi. So what he can do is he can apply sigma x <clears throat> to the state, all right? And that can, so if I apply sigma x to sigma x psi, I'm just gonna get psi. <clears throat> and uh, he can do the same thing, for example, if she gets phi plus, uh, we don't have to worry about the minus signs out front of the states, that's irrelevant. Um, if uh, if Alice gets phi plus, Bob will get uh, the sigma z times psi, and then he can just apply sigma z to the state and he'll get psi. So in all cases, Alice does the measurement, she tells Bob what she got, and that then Bob can apply a correction operator and then he will have the state psi. So, so, <clears throat> Bob applies correction. And the result, Bob has psi. So psi has been transmitted from Alice to Bob using an entangled state. And I should just mention that um, what about Alice's end? This, uh, so Alice was, if you remember, started with the state psi here, all right? And at the end of the procedure, the state psi on Alice's end is completely destroyed. Okay. And Bob has the whole thing. 
I mean, it's not possible for Alice to still have psi and Bob to also get psi because that would violate the no cloning theorem of quantum information. And for quantum information, you cannot build a machine that will uh, clone uh, perfectly uh, an arbitrary quantum state. So it, if you're doing teleportation, the, if the state ends up with Bob, that means that what Alice has uh, contains no information about psi whatsoever. Okay, so that is one network protocol. Um, and again, that one, uh, this one did not require that Alice know what psi is. Okay, so for teleportation, Okay, Alice uh, does not need to know. Okay, and the other thing is, uh, let's talk about uh, the information that Alice does send Bob. So Alice tells Bob the result of her measurement. Now her measurement has four possible results uh, because there are four possible Bell basis elements. So that means that the classical information she sends Bob is two bits, because two, uh, two bits represent four possibilities. So uh, the other thing is that Alice sends Bob, oops, two bits of classical, information. Okay, so now we want to talk about a second network protocol, which is called remote state preparation. In this one, Alice does know the state. Mm. And in particular, uh, the state is of a particular kind. Mm. Well, uh, uh, okay. minus i theta one. So it's not a, a totally ge a general quantum state. Uh, it's one um, where it's parameterized by the angle theta and Alice wants to be able to control theta and send that particular state to Bob. So how does she do it and how is it different from teleportation? So it starts off the same. So we still have Alice over here. And she and Bob share a singlet state. Uh, let's see. Now, what, hap what happens now is that Alice, uh, since she knows the state, there, there's, no, there's no extra qubit in this case. They're, they're just the two qubits. So Alice is going to measure her single qubit in the following basis. So um, uh, I think I probably need more room. So let me go to another page. No, no, no. What did I just do? Okay. Uh-oh. Uh, um, uh, Okay, so Alice measures plus minus theta equals one over square root of two e to the i theta zero plus minus e to the minus i theta one. So he just, she just measures uh, her state in that basis. So what's going to happen? 
So we'll, so let's just do what we did before. Alice gets and Bob gets. Now singlet states have the prop, <clears throat> property that what Alice is going to get, Bob's going to get the get the opposite. <clears throat> so at least for this type of state. So if Alice gets plus theta, Bob is going to get minus minus theta. And again, the, the sign out front is irrelevant. <clears throat> and if she gets minus theta, Bob gets plus theta. Now, Alice can't control what she's going to get. Uh, she will get plus theta or minus theta with equal probabilities, probability one half. And so again, it's a kind of correction procedure. So it's suppose, suppose Alice wants to send um, uh, uh, suppose she wants to send plus theta to Bob. But she got plus theta for her measurement. Okay, so you can see that if she got plus theta, in other words, up here, then Bob has minus theta, and that's not what she wants. She wants Bob to have plus theta. So what she does is she, well, she tells Bob what measurement she got, and um, you can see that um, uh, Bob can correct. By applying. Sigma Z to his state. So again, we have a situation where Alice can send a particular quantum state to Bob. In this case, she knows what it is. And uh, also let's look at the classical communication cost. So, um, so how many bits does Alice send to Bob? <clears throat> so Alice sends all right, so in this case, there are only two alternatives. Um, so Alice is either gonna get plus theta or she's gonna get minus theta. So that's only one bit of information. So for the remote state preparation, Alice sends one bit, not two like in teleportation. I don't know whether you can hear that, but we, ha we have a noisy cat, okay. Um, so Alice, in this case, sends only one bit of classical information to Bob. Uh, this is a more restrictive procedure because with teleportation, Alice can send any state to Bob. With this, uh, and also she doesn't have to know what the state is. In this procedure, Alice has to know what the state is um, and it's of a particular form, but, the, uh, but she only has to uh, send one bit one bit of classical information instead of two, as in the case of teleportation. Now there's a variation on remote state preparation. Um, so let me talk about that. Um, So this is, uh, let's see, I guess I'll, get, I guess I'll call this one three, All right? <clears throat> so remote state preparation for multiple receivers. So suppose we have the following scenario, um, that we have Alice over here, and we have Bob, and we also have Charlie. <clears throat> And Alice wants to send the same state to Bob and Charlie. So Alice wants to send let's say plus theta 
equals one over square root of two. Same thing we had before, e to the i theta zero um, plus e to the minus i theta one. Okay, two, both Bob and Charlie. So how can she, we, how can she do this? Now, in this, in this case, Alice does know the state that she's going to be sending. She, and it, it's of that kind of restricted form. And she wants to have Bob and Charlie end up with, uh, each of them have, end up with that state. So how can she do that? All right, now the way she's going to do it is it's going to be a slightly more complicated state than the type we've been dealing with. Um, so, okay, she's going to be entangled with Bob and she's going to be entangled with Charlie. And, and Bob and Charlie are both going to have qubits. And Alice is going to have what's called a Q-trit, a three-level system instead of a two-level system. And they're going to start in the following state. A, B, C, okay, for Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And it looks like one half times zero for Alice. Uh, and then we have zero, zero for Bob and Charlie, plus one for Alice. And then we have one, one for Bob and Charlie. And then we have two for Alice. So because it's a Q trip, I've, I've got one more basis state for Alice. And then that is going to be zero, one, Bob, Charlie, plus one, zero, Bob, Charlie. So we're going to start with that th uh, three particle qubit state. Oh, well, actually, no, it's not a three particle state, one of which is a Q trit and the other two of which are qubits. So, um, so what does she do? Okay, so Alice has a unitary operator. Trit, not a qubit. As so, what does it do? It take if I let me let me put an A on it since to remind us that it's for Alice. So if it I'm acting on zero, it gives e to the two i theta zero. And if it acts on uh, one, it gives e to the minus two i theta acting on one, and if it acts on, uh, acts on two, ugh, this must be an A. If it acts on two, it just gives two back. It does nothing. So what Alice does is she, um, she applies that mm, She applies that operator to psi ABC. Okay, so that's going to encode the information about theta into psi ABC. But then um, somehow she has to then disentangle Bob and Charlie from both her and from each other. So, so Alice needs to... Right. So how's she going to do that? What she's going to do is she's going to measure her Q trip. And let's see what happens if she does that. And what kind of measurement is she going to do? So uh, let's move on to another page here. 
Oh, you nuts, don't do that. I keep hitting the wrong thing. Luckily, it doesn't seem to be doing any damage. Um, so Alice measures her Q-trip. Okay, and it looks like, um, call it UJ. Okay, <clears throat> we're in a three-dimensional space, so it's some K equals um, one to three. And then I have E to the, that's supposed to be an E to the two pi IJK over three. And k minus one, Alice. So she measures, a, and this is j equals zero, one, two, uh, zero, one, two. So she measures in that basis. And so she's going to get one of three results. She's either going to get u zero, u one, or u two. So, uh, so let's see what uh, Charlie and Bob end up with if she gets these different results. So we're going to have Alice gets like we had before and um and then yeah so if alice gets u0 then bob and charlie end up with 1 over square root of 2 times e to the i theta 0 plus e to the minus sine theta one. So in that case, that is exactly what we want to happen. So, uh, so if Alice gets u zero, Bob and Charlie are disentangled and, uh, and they get the state that Alice wants. Okay, so what happens if she gets one of the other basis states? So if she gets u one, <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Bob and Charlie get the following state: one over square root of two, <laughs> e to the minus i pi over three, e to the i theta zero. Okay, plus e to the um, plus i pi over three. Uh, wait, and then e to the minus i theta. one. They're, again, they're disentangled and they have that state. Now, the problem there is, of course, they have this extra phase factor uh, that they don't really want there, that e to the either plus or minus i pi over three, but that's easy to get rid of. Um, uh, they um, Well, let's call it UBC, and then that acts on zero um, to give me e to the i pi over three, zero, and it acts on one to give e to the minus i pi over three, one. So Bob and Charlie can each apply this operator and you can see it's what it's going to do is it's going to get rid of those phase factors that we don't want. In other words, the e to the plus and minus i pi over threes. And then that will give us um, the state that Alice wanted to send. So again, uh, Alice, if she gets u1, Bob and Charlie can apply correction operators. And, and notice that, that, that Bob and Charlie don't have to cooperate to do this. Um, they, they simply independently apply this qubit operator, and then they will get the state that Alice wanted to send them. Uh, just to sort of finish things off, if Alice gets U2, um, Bob and Charlie get um, almost the same thing. It's just the signs are reversed. Uh, one over square root of two times E to the I, I over three, uh, zero plus e to the minus i pi 
over three e to the minus i theta one. <clears throat> okay. And again, Bob and Charlie can correct. Okay. So you can use remote state preparation to send a known state um, uh, to more than one receiver. Uh, so that is that's the lesson here. Okay. Okay. Oh, and that, okay. So let me just mention that this works. And in principle, one could do this by, by having Alice just teleport the state to everybody. But it turns out that this, proce this procedure, this remote state preparation procedure is much less costly in terms of entanglement. And it's also much less costly in terms of uh, class communication. It, because in, in this procedure, I won't discuss the entanglement costs, but the classical <laughs> communication cost is less because if I were to tell, if Alice were to teleport things to Bob and Charlie, uh, she would have to send each of them a different message because the teleportation uh, would not necessarily, oops, okay, got my my friend here, okay, uh, would um, come in uh, with different messages. And in the case of remote state preparation, uh, the message to Bob and Charlie is exactly the same. So she only has to send one message. And in the case of teleportation, she would have to send different messages to the, uh, the different receivers. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about, and this is the one that is important for trying to send over longer distances, is something called entanglement swapping. Okay, so uh, now suppose that we have the following situation. We have, um, we've got Alice, Bob, and Charlie again, but the situation looks a little different and we want to do something different. So here's Alice. And she shares a singlet state with Bob. And, and then we have Bob here. And we have Charlie here. So this is a singlet. And this is a singlet. So we start off with an Alice entangled with Bob. And we have Charlie entangled with Bob. but Alice is not entangled with Charlie. Mm. So what we want to do is we want Bob to do something so that he's kind of pulled out of the picture and Alice ends up entangled with Charlie. So we want... Mm, Okay, so first of all, why would we want to do something like this? Well, remember I told you about these distance limitations. So the idea is suppose we could create singlet states over a distance of hundred kilometers, but no more. 
So Alice and Bob could be 100 kilometers apart, and Bob and Charlie could be 100 kilometers apart. And so we can create entanglement over those distances, but we can't create entanglement over Alice and Charlie. They're too far apart. Trying to send the qubits directly would cause the noise would kill the entanglement. So if we can fix it so that Alice and Bob are entangled and Bob and Charlie are entangled, and then he can transfer that entanglement to Alice and Charlie, then we would have Alice and Charlie 200 kilometers apart and being entangled. So, so this is the way to get around this uh, business about amplifiers introducing noise, uh, is to use entanglement swapping. I'll tell you how to do it in just a second. And this is the basis for something called a quantum repeater. So uh, the quantum repeater, uh, so you would have a channel, and every so often you would have a quantum repeater, and then you'd have entanglement between the quantum repeater and the first user, and then maybe entanglement between the quantum repeater and the, and the receiver, and then the quantum repeater would fix it so that the transmitter and the receiver are in fact entangled. And, or you could have several quantum repeaters along the line uh, that are then entangled with each other. And then they, again, they transfer the entanglement to the, um, <clears throat> to the uh, sender and receiver. So how do they do that? Well, we're sort of back to our good old bell basis again. So let me just um, write out what the state looks like uh, the Alice Bob Charlie state looks like, and then you can sort of see what will happen. All right, so let me, um, so we have Alice and Bob share a singlet and Bob and Charlie share a singlet, okay? So we have um, uh, phi minus uh, uh, Alice Bob, okay, and then we have phi minus Bob. Charlie, okay, so we have a four qubit state that looks like that. Now I'm gonna rewrite that state uh, in a different way. I think I can squeeze it in here. Let's see what happens. Okay, one half times. Um, okay, and so after a little bit of algebra, you will find out that it looks like this. Uh, uh, this would be, okay, um, let's call this Bob one and Bob two. All right, so this will be um, Bob one, Bob two, phi plus Alice Charlie, okay, plus, I don't know, I guess this one's minus, okay. Now let me see if I can squeeze it in up there. Okay, minus, okay, and that is phi minus, and that is Bob one, Bob two, and then phi minus Alice Charlie. <clears throat> okay, and then I have uh, minus. <clears throat> um, this looks a little funny. One of these is probably supposed to be a plus sign, but I, I'm not going to try to figure it out now. Um, Bob one, Bob two. Uh, and then I have um, phi plus, uh, so, sorry, phi plus. So, okay, psi plus AC. As I said, I'm sure one of these must be a plus sign, but anyway. Mm. Alice Charlie. All right, so just doing a bit of algebra, and I said I was probably not quite right. Um, I think I should have two plus signs and two minus signs in there. Um, you'll notice that uh, if I write it in this form, uh, each of the terms is an entangled state for just for Bob, and then and an entangled state for Alice and Charlie. So what Bob does is he measures his state in the Bell basis. And you can see what's going to happen is, uh, for example, if he gets phi plus, then Alice and Charlie are going to be in the state phi plus, and they will be entangled. Um, again, if he gets, just to pick another one, if he gets psi plus, 
um, then Alice and Charlie are going to be entangled and they will be in the state psi plus. So, um, And the result is that Alice and Charlie are entangled. So, so that is the way to, or at least one of the, I say one of the two ways of trying to get around this distance limitation on trying to send things through, for example, optical fibers. The other is in fact, to try to use satellites. So if we had satellites that were uh, well, uh, producing entangled particles, shooting them down um, and, um, uh, one to uh, might have been Hefe because there's a very big Chinese research quantum information Chinese research institute in Hefe, and um, uh, and then the other one to Vienna. They can use the then they could use the entangled state to do, for example, they could uh, use it to do teleportation, um, and um, uh, or they or they could use it to do quantum cryptography because uh, there are quantum crypto cryptography protocols that use entangled states. So there would be a number of possible uses for the fact that, say, Vienna and Hefe are sharing an entangled state. So, um, uh, so that's one way to create entanglement. Entanglement swapping is another. So that which is the basis for quantum repeaters. So if you have, if you're sending things through fibers, you have. The quantum repeaters, which are essentially doing entanglement swapping every so so many uh, kilometers, and then that would allow you to send a, uh, an entangled state, uh, create an entangled state between a sender and a receiver. Okay, so that's really all I have to say. And um, the workshop is going to have all kinds of stuff uh, you know, beyond this, but this is just to sort of get your feet wet and give you an idea of what some of the quantum communication uh, procedures are that form the basis for quantum networks. Um, let me see, it seems like, uh, I think, let me just take a look at the chat since I see we've got three, okay. Uh, okay, uh, okay, so the first one, yes, we are recording it. Uh, okay, so I have to run to the meeting, okay. Uh, all right, okay, so no questions yet. <laughs> um, okay. So does anyone have any questions on this? I said the in the in the workshop you're also going to hear about um I mean I was just talking about theory here. Uh you're going to hear from the people who are really building these things um and what they can do and what what the problems they have are. Uh so uh, again uh, those of you who are interested I would highly encourage you to uh come to the workshop next week. Okay. Thank you so much professor that was a really nice like review before okay. the workshop okay thank you <laughs>